Hello everyone, welcome to The Buzz. I'm Susie Lytle and I can't believe this is our season two finale. Before the year is done, we wanna share with you how volunteering for our habitat management can be the perfect New Year's resolution. Then we'll talk about the district's accomplishments for the year, our favorite buzz moments, and give you a glimpse of what's to come. So let's celebrate 2021 on this episode of The Buzz. I want you to close your eyes and imagine a time before shopping malls and highways. Picture what the landscape would look like in the 1700s. Think of open prairies with grasses waving in the wind, or quiet forests with deer sneaking through, or wetlands with hungry herons ready to hunt. To create these natural areas today, we need restoration. Now we can't get it back to exactly how it was, but we can bring in a lot of these same native species to get to where the habitat will be thriving and kickstart it in the right direction. Restoration means identifying the natural resource and bringing it back to that natural state. We've seen this kind of work before on the buzz, whether it's reconstructing the waterways at Hadley Valley, reintroducing fire like we saw at Braidwood Dunes in Savannah, or replanting some of these native plants like winter seed sowing at Fort Creek. During this time of year, a lot of volunteers and crews are working on removing non-native species throughout the county. In the past few weeks, we've been busy at a number of preserves, including Keepetaw Preserve and here at Hickory Creek Preserve. There are a lot of terms when describing plants when it comes to restoration. So first off is our native plants. These are the plants that have been here for centuries. They know our habitats and they thrive in lots of our crazy Midwestern weather. Then on the flip side, you have non-native. So these are plants that are originally from somewhere else. It could be just outside our Midwest range, but a lot of times we deal with ones further away, ones from uh, Europe or Asia. Another term is invasive species. So an invasive species is a plant or an animal that totally takes over, outcompetes our native species. So examples include Asian carp in our waterways or honeysuckle in our forests. These plants aren't necessarily bad plants, they just don't belong here. They don't have natural predators to keep them in check. So when they grow, they grow like crazy and they tend to knock out anything else that's supposed to be growing here. And the key is we want biodiversity. With invasive species, sometimes you just get one singular plant in a habitat. For example, if we didn't remove honeysuckle, the forest starts to close in. Like you can see on this side, the honeysuckle kind of creates this huge wall. Now with a thick wall like this, wildlife can't really move around and other plants can't grow. To give you an idea, this is what the before looks like. It's very compacted, very tight, no space, <laughs> and the goal is to make it look more open. Like this, you can see that it's nice, wide and open space, a lot of room for the trees to grow, a lot of sunlight to hit the floor. We've also seen that the honeysuckle will start to creep in into other habitats like our prairie. Overall, it takes a lot of hard work to keep these invaders at bay. Biodiversity means we have a wide range and variety of life in our ecosystem. If we only had honeysuckle, that means the birds would only have those berries to eat. Imagine if you had to eat strawberries for every meal for the rest of your life. Now, it would not only get boring, but it's probably not the most healthy thing either. Now imagine if you had six different types of plants eat berries, their seeds, and then all the caterpillars that eat them, all the insects. The more plants you get, the more animals you can get. This is also important for diseases and destruction that invasive species can cause. In the past, we've dealt with Dutch elm disease and emerald ash borer that have targeted our elm and ash trees. Because of biodiversity, we have other trees such as oaks, hickories, maples, linden, that can keep life going, even though the ash and elms were targeted. To accomplish all this habitat management, it takes a coordinated effort between staff and volunteers to get the job done. 
Leading our habitat management is Barbara Sherwood, and she is a restoration crew leader and our volunteer liaison with the conservation department. Thank you so much for joining us today. And my first question is who can volunteer for these work days? So for these work days, they are open to all ages. 16 and under do need to be accompanied by a parent or guardian, but through my experience, I would recommend ages 10 and up. Is there any kind of special training you need to participate? Uh, no, actually no previous experience is required. When you show up on site, you'll be provided with safety equipment and instructions. Um, there are also veteran volunteers on site that will assist with leading and demonstrating. If volunteers find they enjoy attending these restoration activities, we can provide training to do some of our more advanced tasks like chainsawing and herbiciding. Oh, awesome. So tell me what a, a normal, typical restoration day looks like. A typical restoration work day has the volunteers come in and we are looking to remove some of the invasive brush that has taken over the landscape. This area, we would want to be open prairie or savanna with just a few trees, but we have invasive species that have come in from Europe and Asia that are taking over and out competing our native plants. So we're coming in, removing the brush, going to burn it in burn piles or stack it in habitat piles. So I see there's brush piles behind us. Uh, what's the purpose of these brush piles and what are the benefits of using them? These brush piles were generated by us cutting down the invasive brush. It has to go somewhere so we try and stack it neatly within the preserve, hopefully to burn immediately or to come back another day and burn the material. But we will leave some brush piles around to provide habitat for wildlife, birds, small mammals, and some reptiles and amphibians. I would think little snakes crawl in there too. Absolutely. They're <laughs> one of my favorites. Looking for shelter and trying to stay warm. Um, but then if we're going to come back and burn those piles, we make sure we move them before so that we don't trap any animals in so there. So they have kind of time to escape and move Absolutely. somewhere else. Absolutely. Yeah, Looking out, to, uh, looking out for our wildlife. Yeah. <laughs> With these brush piles, is it possible to leave them behind? Like they're wood, so I would think they would naturally decompose over time. And they will. They will decompose over time, and we leave some to provide shelter for wildlife. However, with these work days, we generate so much material that mm -hmm. to leave all of those brush piles, it would smother the native vegetation, look very unsightly. Um, and we also want to avoid leaving behind seed from the material we Right, cut. we don't want more to grow just Ex around the pile. <laughs> exactly. So um, we minimize the number of piles we leave behind. Okay. How do we know what native plants were once here? Oh, we look to uh, public records that give us a historic description of what the landscape looked like. Specifically, we reference the public land surveys from the 1830s um, that show us what it was like pre-European settlement. So in referencing the public land surveys, we see that on average, Will County only had 10 trees per acre. And if you look around here, you can see it is more dense. All this habitat management takes a lot of hard work and dedicated volunteers. I'm joined with Ron now. This is Mark Benton, and he's been with us for a long time, right? How long have you been with the district? Oh, for about seven years. What got you started to volunteering? I enjoy working with other volunteers. I enjoy learning from other volunteers. Um, I enjoy the exercise. And then certainly as you go through the, through the uh, day volunteering, then as you finish, you reflect on what it is that you just accomplished. Here at LaPorte Road, we've made a, a significant change in the, uh, the amount of, um, say, teasel that's here. So we've um, pretty much you know, almost eradicated it here, or at least have it under really good control. Um, but we're actively managing um, honeysuckle and buckthorn, uh, autumn olive, and uh, even calorie pear. So what would you say to someone who may be on the fence with volunteering with the district? Sure, well, I'd say come on out, give it a try. Uh, there's a good chance that you're gonna learn something new and, and uh, certainly meet a lot of like-minded people. And, uh, and along the way, then you're gonna be improving a location for everyone to enjoy for years to come. Hickory Creek Preserve is one of our best examples of a volunteer presence. We have several long-term committed stewards that work here, as well as we host several work days throughout the year. Well, like most things, we're always working with limited resources. Getting volunteers in, it brings in more people to help. Many hands make light work, and we make such good progress with a big group. Environmental issues can be overwhelming. Whether it's scientists talking about climate change, 
plastic in our waterways, habitat destruction, endangered species, it's tough to know how to help and where to start. Well, volunteering with our Restoration Workdays is a great place to feel good and help your local preserves. You'll feel good as you take down that honeysuckle, open up those spots, and see a transition and transformation right before your eyes. Now, if restoration isn't your thing, there's plenty of other volunteer opportunities to do with the district. Head to our website and look for the How to Get Involved tab and see which job is a perfect fit for you. If you love raptors, especially bald eagles and owls, mark your calendars for Saturday, January 8th. That's when Eagle Watch swoops into Four Rivers Environmental Education Center in Chanahan. This area is a prime spot for bald eagles because these majestic birds flock to open water in the winter to hunt for fish. While other areas freeze over, barge traffic keeps the Des Plaines River flowing. After bouncing back from the brink of extinction, bald eagles represent strength and resilience and command attention when they fly over. This free program will feature presentations from Who's Woods Raptor Center, and there will be several live raptors in the building with a bald eagle and great gray owl making appearances. You can venture out on your own for some eagle spotting or join us on one of our guided hikes. Hopefully there will be eagles perched in trees or soaring in the sky. Nature is wild and unpredictable, so you never know what we'll see. But we may hit the jackpot. The family-friendly event will feature a number of crafts and activities. There's also an opportunity to grab some grub. No registration is required for this event. For more information, visit reconnectwithnature.org. The Northern Cardinal is one of the most recognizable birds in Illinois. In fact, Illinois was the first of seven states to declare a cardinal its state bird. Cardinals don't migrate, so these are reliable neighbors in our preserves and in your yards that can be seen on warm sunny days or cold snowy ones. Cardinals are medium-sized colorful songbirds. The males are bright red with a black face. Females are more of a creamy tan with red highlights. They both sport this crest or mohawk that gives them a lot of personality. Their color and their crest look a lot like the vestment and headpieces worn by cardinals of the Catholic Church, which inspired the bird's name. Winter is a fun time to see these cardinals because their bright red color really pops on the snowy white days. And this isn't just a trick of the eye, it has something to do with how the birds molt. Like most birds, they molt their feathers at the end of breeding season, around early fall. For cardinals, when they grow in these new feathers, they are actually kind of tipped in gray. Throughout the winter, this gray wears off, and then that red is ready to shine. Come spring, they're looking their reddest to impress the ladies. One unique trait of cardinals is that both males and females sing. Now, usually singing is just left to male songbirds to impress a mate but researchers have found that female cardinals are actually singing on their nest. And this could be a song of, hey, bring me more food. You may hear cardinals before you see them. In the winter, you'll hear high pitch, chip, chip, chip. And these are contact calls or alarms. Now come warmer days and in the spring and the summer, you'll start hearing long whistling songs. These songs are to defend their territory or to track a mate. These longer songs have different patterns, but I think they sound like laser beams shooting off. Pew, 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 pew. They live in the entire eastern half of the United States, parts of Mexico, and even Central America. They like the forest edges and our shrubby landscapes around our houses. They'll nest in dense brush. They like to eat seeds, grains, berries, and insects. So if you want to attract cardinals to your backyard, try planting native plants to get the berries and insects, and try black oiled sunflower seeds in your feeders.
the goal of the buzz is to take viewers on a journey throughout the preserves through all the seasons, catch rare wildlife moments, and give you a front row seat to the district's projects. Now, as the year is coming to a close, we wanna take a moment to reflect. Let's talk about the district's biggest accomplishments, our favorite buzz moments, and a little teaser of what will be next. We're making many improvements in our Will County Forest Preserves, and the district is always acquiring new land. This year, we've increased our holdings by 7% to more than 23,000 acres. These parcels of land are significant because they allow us to extend our trails and greenways and expand our natural areas. Speaking of extending trails, we have just finished the Black Road Bridge project, which now connects Hamill Woods with Rock Run Preserve. This also provides a safe passage for visitors to pass over the DePage River and Interstate 55. This project started about 22 years ago with a line on a map, and it's taken a long time to secure the right fundings, the right kind of placement, weather conditions, and many other complications. So we're very thrilled to cross this one off our list. We've improved river safety for kayakers along the DuPage River this year by removing the Hamill Woods Dam. We work together with the Conservation Foundation and the Lower DuPage River Watershed Coalition. This was another project that took years of planning, but once all the pieces fell into place, removing the dam happened very swiftly. Now this doesn't only benefit humans, but also fish and wildlife now are free to move throughout their ecosystem. A lot of work was done in our preserves, but also at our facilities. Al Lakash Museum in Romeoville transports visitors back into the 18th century, where the area was once the home of the fur trade. The museum campus has undergone a lot of improvements, such as a boardwalk and deck, interpretive signage, and a brand new pavilion overlooking the river. Now that we've discussed the district's big projects, let's take a moment to relax by a fire and talk about our favorite buzz moments of the year. The Buzz has had a great time following all these projects, and we wanted to take a moment to review some of our favorite moments and maybe share some behind the scene things you may have not have seen. Finally, join me on the other side of the camera is Chad Murda, our digital communications manager, who is responsible for filming, editing, and promoting this show. Chad, thank you for finally joining me on this side. It's kind of weird, but yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, we want to talk about uh, how we film the show. We do it every month through all the seasons. So we've gone through a whole year now. One of my uh, things that come to mind is the Bald Eagle Day at Rock Run Rookery. Remember the weather? <laughs> that turned on us at a dime. I think when we started it was sunny and by the time we were done it was uh... Blizzard. White out blizzard conditions <laughs> and we could barely see you on camera. Yeah, I remember just standing there and just getting plummeted by, it wasn't even snow, it was ice, it was hail, it was a little bit of everything, and then like all the behind the scenes was just fog and snow. And sometimes you have to make the decision, are you going to finish this or try to come back another day and we just tried to uh, suck it up. Yeah, we toughed it out that day. From a really snowy, freezing day, in March we did prescribed burns, which was a cool day, but it was super, super hot. <laughs> I think one of the interesting things about that that you, I noticed in editing it is from the beginning of the burn to the end of the burn, it really had an effect on you. And you could see <laughs> by the end, your, your voice is a little different, the, your eyes are a little puffy, and that's just, it was a rough day shooting out there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> These, oh my God, it's so bad. <laughs> I think I'm slightly allergic to smoke, no big deal. Like my sinuses and everything did. Yep, we're gonna just try it. <laughs> I've shot burns before, um, more from a distance, mm -hmm. and being right up in it with them, it really gives you a good idea of what those crews are going through. And sometimes they're doing multiple burns within a week. Right. I also felt like I was like a live on the scene reporter because we kind of just watched what they were doing and then figured out what to say later. <laughs> and I think one of the cool things too was when we put the drone up and you could see the orchestrated effort that goes in and they have like a ring of fire and they're trying to close in on an area where when you're on the ground, it just kind of seems like random right, pieces are on walking. fire. Yeah. Another interesting thing about this show is we're trying to capture wildlife, which doesn't always cooperate. And one of my favorite birds I really want to do a segment over is the Pileated Woodpecker. 
and it's always at Messenger Woods. But of course, like when we have cameras, I can never find it. But one moment was when we were doing the wildflowers at Messenger Woods. Another famous flower for Messenger Woods is the great white trillium, seen right here. And all suddenly, da -na 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 -na. do you remember hearing that like crazy drumming? Right, and, and we kept looking for it and didn't see it until right off in the distance we saw it swoop out of a tree but couldn't get it on camera. On the buzz, we tend to tell a lot of different kinds of stories, either wildlife or preserves or trails. One special moment of this season was telling Beth Temple's story and how she's donating her land to the Forest Preserve. On a lot of our segments we do on the buzz, we're kind of out there the day of, and that was one that we went out multiple times to meet with her and kind of get the lay of the land and get more of the background story. And it was just really nice to meet her, talk to her, and kind of see the impact that the Forest Preserves had had on her. So much though, she wants to leave all of her land to us so it's preserved for future generations. Yeah, she is an awesome, awesome lady. She comes to my painting programs and totally like outpaints me. And then even when we were filming at the conclusion after we had a whole day with her, she was like, oh no, I'm gonna just plant and go into my garden and do like hard labor. Like she's amazing. She has way more energy than I do. <laughs> <Yes. my age. laughs> One of the more visual like techniques that we use when filming this show is the drone shot. So you have a drone, you're certified, and that's how we can get more of these aerial views. And we had an idea of like, what if we shot a whole episode all with drone? And I applaud you because that was a lot of work on your end. It was, we had, I think we shot 20 or 25 preserves, not all of them made the cut, but it was a lot of work to go around. And you know, when you're on the ground, you can get a pretty good idea of the scenery and the lay of the land. But once you put it up in the air, you really get a much larger appreciation for just how expansive some of these locations are and areas that you may not know even exist because they're a little bit off trail. Especially when they're like tucked into like cities, like I think of Hickory Creek and you kind of, it's a big, big preserve, but you don't really realize it until like you zoom out and then you see these giant trees just in the middle of like suburbia. Right, and, and shooting that episode brought some challenges. We have restrictions on when we can fly, um, weather plays a big factor. So hitting some of these was, you know, kind of hard to get into the into our schedule. From flying above the preserves and seeing nice up high views, we almost went under in the beaver episode. So I had this great idea to go find beaver lodges or some at Moni Reservoir. What I didn't take into account is how mucky it is back there. <laughs> in that episode, in order to get close to the beaver dams, we were outfitted in chest waders mm -hmm. and we're walking through there. And at one point, at the beginning, we're a little bit, you know, very carefully going through there and you kind of, your confidence kind of builds up at a certain right. point. <laughs> and then there was the point where I took one step and there was about a three foot drop off and very close to having the waders fill up with water, go under and trash all of our equipment. And, and the other thing on that day, it was brutally hot. It had to be in the 90s, <laughs> full humidity. And you haven't really lived until you're wearing waders for a couple hours and you mm -hmm. can feel the moisture pooling in the bottom of your feet. It was pretty lovely. When we peeled all of them off, I mean, that was a bonding experience. <laughs> it was definitely the grossest day we've ever filmed. Yes, I agree. <laughs> when we film wildlife segments, um, it's pretty much guaranteed that wildlife will never cooperate. And one thing that I really tried to make sure we got everything of was the monarch. So at Plum Creek Nature Center, we raise educational monarchs from eggs to caterpillar to butterflies. And on our day shooting, it was just timed so perfectly that there was a chrysalis that opened up right before our eyes. Like I couldn't plan that out any better. Another fun tidbit about this show is when you see the final product, it's very clean and polished, uh, but it does take a lot of work to get there. There are bloopers that I'm sure you would just have stockpiles of. Uh, I know there's moments where I have my sensitive eyes, if it's like smoky, if it's sunny, if it's too bright, like my eyes are watering. So I'm sure there's tons of that, especially on the prescribed burn day. And then uh, sometimes I just can't spit out the darn words. <laughs> they just don't come to me. <laughs> Honeybees are cavendy. Yeah, yeah. No. Not working now. No. <laughs> Has been coming here. Oh my God, have been coming here. I can get this. This is the line. <laughs> Looking to the future, we have a brand new year full of district projects and goals for the buzz. Four Rivers Environmental Education Center in Shanahan is getting new exhibits and new trails for the public to enjoy soon. The district is also getting a major acquisition, Hidden Oaks Nature Center and Hidden Lakes Trout Farm in Bolingbrook. 
Plus, we'll be extending more trails. First one up is Veterans Memorial Trail. As for the buzz, we still have so much more to explore. Join us for season three. We have lots of ideas. Right, one of them will be doing some day trips on our trails. We have lots of regional trails, which you can go from one part of the county to the other without ever uh, hitting the road. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm excited to uh, check back at Hamill Woods Dam. Now that's gone, we're gonna kayak in the river and see the differences. And of course, there's wildlife everywhere. So coyotes, deer, snakes, any encounters like that in the preserves always make good topics. I am so excited. So please join us for our next adventure. We hope you enjoyed season two of The Buzz. I love sharing my favorite places, wildlife, and activities with you. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey, and I hope you learned something new to share with your family and friends. Check out reconnectwithnature.org to sign up for our volunteer opportunities or join us for a program in person or virtually. I hope to see you in the new year, but until then, I'll see you next time on The Buzz.